Audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. The message Jesus is giving to us is that the problem with helping others is that you may have to alter the way you are presently living. It may change your living circumstances if you're going to become compassionate and a Christ follower. And if you were to complain to Jesus about, I think Jesus would say, yep, That's why it's not called pity. Pity is just feeling sorry for someone. This is called mercy, which always requires sacrifice, generosity, and a cause. Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines. We are taking the gospel to the world. Pastor, apologist, and Bible teacher. One truth that will be delivered in love and compassion, connecting every one person to all that God has promised them. You make me wonder. Today. Today. Today with Jeff Fines. Hi, my name is Bill, and welcome to Today with Jeff Fines. We have another episode in the series on pursuing Jesus. We're finishing off a message from last time. It's based on the well known parable of the Good Samaritan. You'll find it in Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Pastor Jeff is using this message to cover a lot of ground. He's speaking about power, idols, the modern Western church, Jesus' response to authorities. Let's hear how he brings it all together and finishes this message off. Remember, you can always catch up on previous messages. You just need to search for Today with Jeff Vines wherever you get your podcasts. Tim Keller, in his outstanding work on radical neighbouring, gives us the following limits. First of all, when we hear who is our neighbor, we want to limit the who. You know, not too long ago, the elders invited three of the leaders of God's pantry. For those of you who don't know what God's pantry is, God's pantry is the city on the hill that cannot be hidden. It is the thing that we've been pursuing for the last eight years, a place in the middle of this valley where if you're in need, any need, food, uh, water, clothing, counseling, temporary housing, job fairs, whatever it is, we wanted to be that place where we knew people, their first thought, those who were in need would be, I can go to this place and they will not judge me, but they will help me and they will give relief to my wounds. So now it's operating, it's up, it's amazing. We invited three of the leaders into the elders meeting to describe to us the success of this ministry. And one of them, I think it was a guy who goes by the name Goose, told us the story. A young family during COVID, young family, when COVID shut things down, he was out of work, but he had a young wife and two young kids. They struggled to make ends meet. And then they struggled to have food, food and clothing. He described how he and his wife had just enough food for the kids. The kids would eat and they would go to bed hungry. And some friend of his told him about this place called God's Pantry. And he went to God's Pantry. He found love. He found what he needed. It gave him such a sense of relief. They gave him food and clothing and even shelter. And now that man back on his feet, guess where he spends his time serving? Back in God's Pantry. Why? Because he's walked in their shoes. He is far less judgmental. He says, this could be me. In fact, this was me. I've been down this road through no fault of my own. He deeply feels the pain and the fear and the frustration. He's been there, done that. The problem with that, if there is one, is this. What about people in whose shoes we have not walked? That we just can't understand how they got where they are. Jesus will not allow us to get away with limiting who we are compassionate toward. The main characters in the story are Jews and Samaritans. In their minds, they have absolutely nothing in common. Jesus will not allow us to limit the who, and neither will he allow us to limit the when, when we do it. My father in Tennessee, we have these tornadoes. We don't have as many uh, now as we used to, but in the 70s and 80s, tornadoes came through. And once they got in those mountains, it was hard to get them to exit. But a tornado actually came to our community and just five blocks away between our street, North Rhone and Mulberry, just five blocks away, the tornado wiped out that street, didn't touch us. I mean, we had some winds, but wiped out that street. My father got involved immediately. He took 
us three kids down as, long, uh, as well as my mom to visit this family who was uh, investigating the devastation. They had lost everything. My father made sure, and he told the other father, he said, we will make sure that you have everything that you need. My mom would take pinto beans and cord brand down every evening. My dad made all of us boys choose some of our favorite clothes and give them away to the kids. He even offered to take them into our house. And I hated that because every time we got people in our house, they always got my bedroom and I had to sleep on the couch. However, as generous as my father was, a family moved in across the street in our neighborhood from New York. And they were a partying family, drugs and orgies. We knew this because they would actually come over and show the pictures to the kids. They were, they were not the nicest of folks. They often needed food and clothing. Both worked at Walmart, but dad would have none of it. And I'd hear dad saying, they are irresponsible. They don't deserve my help. Some people get what they ask for. They're suffering because of stupid decisions. Now I honor my dad often, but my dad wasn't perfect and he wasn't right about everything. Because in this parable, don't you see? Jesus gives us a character in the story who's in desperate need. The guy in the story who ends up saving him would have typically thought this guy deserves what he's gotten. God has exacted his punishment on this blasphemer. This oppressor of mine is finally reaping what he has sown. God finally got him. Now, I know that none of you would ever wish an opposing member of a political party any harm, right? Jews saw Samaritans as their oppressors. Samaritans saw Jews as their oppressors. Jesus is very strategic in his story. A friend does not save a friend. An enemy saves a supposed enemy. Jesus will not allow us to limit the who. He will not allow us to limit the when. He will not allow us to limit how much. I've heard people say, I can't afford to help others. I'm struggling to keep my head above water. Listen carefully. In Jesus' story, in the parable, he places the parable on a stretch of road about which everyone would have known. I've seen this stretch of road. I've been to Jerusalem. A particularly dangerous stretch of road between Jerusalem and Jericho that then was called the Pass of Blood. It was called that because it was very common for thieves to jump you, rob you, leave you for dead. And this is exactly what happens to the guy in Jesus' story. So it wouldn't be that far-fetched. And then as he lay wounded, the priest and the Levite passed by. Jesus strategically puts that into the story. Now, why did the priest, I mean, these are religious people, right? You know, these are the religious. Why did they pass by? The answer is because they were smart. Haven't you seen those YouTube videos where it's a news story where someone... Uh, 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 pretends to be broken down on the side of the road and then some good Samaritan stops to help and they ambush the good Samaritan and bad things happen? Well, that's exactly what would happen on the pass of blood. People knew this. So if you came upon someone who was in disarray, if you're concerned primarily about your own safety, you're gonna pass by on the other side as quickly as you can. The other thing yet is that if, if the person's not dead yet, then it's possible the robbers could still be close by. So stopping could be fatal. When the Samaritan stops, he's risking everything. This is the height of generosity and sacrifice. He's basically saying, I am willing to pay anything it takes to save this man's life. <laughs> the message Jesus is giving to us is that the problem when, with helping others is that you may have to alter the way you are presently living. It may change your living circumstances if you're going to become compassionate and a Christ follower. And if you were to complain to Jesus about, I think Jesus would say, yep, that's why it's not called pity. Pity is just feeling sorry from some, someone. This is called mercy, which always requires sacrifice, generosity, and a cost. Listen to what C.S. Lewis writes in Mere Christianity. I do not believe that one can settle how much we ought to give I am afraid that the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. In other words, if our expenditure on comforts, luxuries, amusements is up to the standard common among those with the same income as ours, we are probably giving away too little. If our charities do not pinch or hamper us, I should say they are too small. There ought to be things we should like to do but cannot do because our charities' expenditure excludes them. 
Jonathan Edwards in the 17th century was trying to convince his congregation of this very kind of generosity and compassion and care. And listen to what he wrote. He said, you congregational members will say, but they're not truly poor. I only have to help people when they are truly destitute. Edwards responds by saying, don't you get concerned about your own situation long before you're destitute? Then should you not love your neighbor as yourself? You and the congregation say, well, they brought it on themselves. Edwards responds, Christ loved you, pitied you, had mercy on you, and set out to relieve you of all your misery that you brought on yourself. Should you not love others as Christ loved you? And then Edwards goes on to say, how can we bear one another's burdens when we only do it when we bear no burdens at all? Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying if, if bearing someone's burden does not in some way become a burden to you, then how can we carry a burden when it's not burdensome to us? It costs us something. It's risky. It requires incredible generosity and sacrifice. Now, stay with me for a moment. I'm almost finished, and then I want to go back and tie that original story. There are two places, sorry, two people Jesus places in the parable at strategic points. Again, they are the priest and the Levite. Now, why would Jesus use these two people? Because he could have come up with, with anyone in that story, tax collectors, publicans, rabbis, sages, politicians. Why a priest and a Levite? And the answer is it was their job. It was your job. It's what you did for a living to distribute alms to the poor. That's what they do. And they're always prepared to do so. The point Jesus is making is that religious people typically help the less fortunate until there is a cost to themselves or when it gets risky to their personhood or perhaps even inconvenient. That's why the priest and the Levite passed by on the other side. They were merely religious. Only a supernatural experience in Christ can transform you to the degree of sacrificing and risking and staggering generosity to people who are supposed enemies. If the tree is really alive, Jesus says, there's going to be fruit. The other thing, mere religion can make you arrogant to where you say, I am blessed because I am good. You are cursed because you are bad. In fact, two of the most religious nations in the world on this planet, India and Thailand, have next to no benevolence because of the tragic belief of karma and reincarnation. In other words, you are suffering because of what you did in a previous life. Therefore, I have no responsibility to help you. Religion without transformation can become heartless and self-righteous and cold. Some of you are listening to this message and you're thinking, wow, I feel enormous guilt. Do you know what my advice for you is? Stop it because guilt will not get you far. Guilt is a temporary motivator at best. It inspires a type of robotic generosity. The key to this, listen, what do I do then, Pastor Jeff? Listen, the key to the story concerns the place Jesus has put the religious scholar in the parable. Had Jesus said to the Jewish lawyer, you know, a man just like you, just like you, a religious man, saw the poor, broken, abused man in the ditch, got off his horse, picked him up and restored him. The Samaritan, the loser in the ditch, the blasphemer, rescued, saved, restored through sacrifice. The lawyer probably would have laughed and said, are you serious? Where did you get this story? No self-respecting Israelite would do something like that. Run over to this unclean oppressor whom God had obviously judged and put out of his misery. No way. This story doesn't inspire me, Jesus, but Jesus places the Samaritan on the horse and the Jew in the ditch because Jesus is asking, what if it's you in the ditch? What if you're the one where your life is about to end? And the only hope you have is an act of free grace from an enemy who owes you nothing but retribution, whom you have oppressed, but gives you a radical sacrificial love that goes beyond pulling you out of the ditch. He restores you completely at great cost to himself. Did you notice that in the parable Jesus told? He not only picks him up, puts him on the donkey, he pays for everything that it's going to require to bring him to complete restoration. Do you see the gospel in this? 
So Jesus is not giving him a do it. He's giving him a new dynamic. What if you were saved by someone who owed you rejection? Wouldn't you get up and begin to look at life completely differently? When you truly understand that you've been saved by a radical grace, your pride will dissipate and you will become the kind of neighbor you need to be. Do you see that? It's important that you do. In the parable, Jesus changed the question from who is my neighbor to who has been the ultimate neighbor to you. It's quite humorous. The lawyer can't even say it. Jesus says, which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of the robbers? The answer is, well, the Samaritan. He can't even say it. He says, well, the one who had mercy on him. I know it sounds old. Stay with me. This is the end. But I finally realized years ago that you cannot manipulate and coerce people into doing good things. You can't. You can't guilt them into it. A good tree will bear fruit. Fruit is a sign of life. So I decided, as I've said numerous times, my job, Steve's job, Rory's job, is to keep giving you Jesus until you get to the point where you say, Jesus keeps giving me mercy and grace when I don't deserve it. He's the ultimate neighbor. He owed me retribution. He gave me forgiveness. He owed me judgment. He gave me grace. And now I look at my life and I wonder why God is so good to me. I wonder why I'm so blessed. I wonder why God puts up with me. And the closer I get to Jesus, the more I recognize how merciful he really is and how undeserving I really am. Am I not then required to be the radical neighbor to others that Jesus Christ has been to me? Okay, Jeff, I got it. Thanks for the parable, but I'm still a little confused. What about that beast thing? Okay, here it is. Over the past few years, We've been stung by culture. And maybe I should have swatted this bee a long time ago. And maybe I have to a degree, but not aggressive enough. And I know some of you think, oh, he's finally going to talk about politics. He's finally going to talk about COVID. He's finally going to talk about vaccinations. He's finally going to talk about AOC, BLM, Donald Trump, Joe Biden. No, I have very little interest in those things. Some, but not a lot. My interest lies in how we Christ followers respond to a fallen world who oppresses us. And as I watch this nation become more and more divided, witnessing more and more vitriolic language coming sometimes from the mouths of Christ followers, where even churches become so possessed with politics that it would appear to outsiders that our real hope and security is in this world not in the world to come, and in a particular party or ideology. I don't say this with harshness. I'm begging all Christians everywhere to pause and to think, we're going to get stung. We can't leave this be alone. We got to whack him before he whacks us. And so please listen carefully to the following statements. One, I love this country and I will never apologize for doing so. And I respect the men and women who have given their lives for our freedoms. Two, this country, like all countries, exists during the fall of humanity. It will have its flaws. Three, the love of money and power is the root of all evil. And that's why we should never place our ultimate hope in the Democrat or Republican parties. They have their agendas that are no longer based upon the good of the American people. Their God is power and control, and we are their sacrifices. I love America and her people. I do, but I am not sure our politicians do anymore. Their policies seem to be based upon one thing, the power, the God of significance, of authority, of gaining more and more power over us. There is an addiction now that's willing to sacrifice the good of all mankind. Okay, Jeff, and I know what comes back. Okay, Jeff, I hear you, but are you just going to sit by and do nothing? No, I'm going to pray and pray hard. Thy kingdom come, your will be done, Lord, on earth as it is in heaven. And I'm going to trust 
and acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. And I'm going to vote because I live in a democracy and I have that privilege and influence. And I will never give up calling America back home to unity, faith, and ultimately to God. But let me tell you where my greatest energies will be spent on creating an alternative community that is so mind-boggling that even my enemies will want to come in. I'm going to love them when they don't love me. I'm going to help and serve them when they're trying to destroy me. I'm going to pull them out of the ditch when they're trying to throw me in it. I'm going to stand up for what is right when they disagree with me, but to do it in such a way that will not be repelled, but perhaps be curious about how I can be so nice to people who consider me their enemy. And I'm going to refuse to put my hope in any leader other than Jesus, any kingdom other than God's, and any truth other than the revealed word of Scripture. And I'm going to do all of this because this is what Jesus did for me. And my question to you is, will you help me? Will you squash the bee that is trying to separate us, the good and the bad, the righteous and the unrighteous, the Democrats and the Republicans, the oppressor and the non-oppressed? Can I humbly tell you something? And I say this in humility. You are blessed to be part of this church. That's right, I said it. Why? Because we're not about us. We're about others. And we will do everything short of sin to help people far from God come near because that's what Jesus told us to do. Go and make disciples of all nations. He didn't just say, only those who are friendly towards you. And I'm asking you in this call as we pursue Jesus, will you help us by realizing that our greatest physical weapon, physical weapon is compassion and service and generosity. I am begging you, find your place in this church. Play a significant role in presenting an alternative community to those who are looking for it because they've lost faith and hope in the one that is here and now. Will you help me make a difference the way Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan? Will you help me love all people? Will you help me return love when hate is given? Little by little makes a bundle as we all play our role, play our part. Are you with me? Let's do this. Let's make a difference because when we're truly pursuing Jesus, we'll be pursuing others. Jesus said, when you've done it to the least of these, the least of these, my brothers, you've done it to me. Father, thank you for a powerful narrative, a parable that Jesus tells us that should open our eyes to the reality that at one point we are, or were at enmity with God. We were the enemies of God. And yet rather than exact retribution, He delivered to us a staggering grace that is a story that is still told across this world today. As Jesus took all of our sins, the retribution we deserved, he took it on his shoulders. And instead of giving anger and wrath, gave love, grace, and mercy to those who opposed him to the point where he even said, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Forgiving those who are taking his life. Now, Father, I pray that this message, as it goes out, would inspire us to stop putting our faith and trust in any political system or leader, giving it a position, making it an idol that can never deliver. But as we stand upon the truth of the good news of the gospel, that our hope and faith and security will be in Christ and Christ alone and his commission to us to go into the world and make disciples. In his name I pray, amen. You've been listening to Today with Jeff Vines. Next time, we'll bring you a new message from Pastor Jeff. You can listen to more messages like this. Just search for Today with Jeff Vines wherever you get your podcasts. You make me wanna dance and sing With every single breath I breathe I will break this offering You are my wonder, you bring the wonder
today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.